we have our first panel coming up and by the way before i before i invite to the stage the rest of the panelists uh let let just let me just say thank you for uh, for the participation we get on slido there were a few questions addressed uh, to regarding latvian government's policy uh with regard to uh, capital market development um, we will have an opportunity to integrate those questions in a later panel where the government representatives will come back so thank you very much for those questions um, um, your speech madam also resonated with a part of our audience uh, we have questions coming in regarding uh, what you said uh, follow-ups and this is something uh, we can do during uh, uh, the panel as well. So uh, once again, thank you very much for participating. Continue doing that. Um, uh, the Slido thing is open for you. Please do log on and, and, and participate. Having said that, uh, our next panel uh, is, uh, Verena is already on the stage. Let me invite Santa Purgaila as well, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Latvia. Jella Benner Heinacher, President of the European Federation of Invest, uh, Investors and Financial Services Users. Jella, thank you very much. Jella. Um, and Peter Koblich, who is President of the Federation of European Securities Exchanges. Uh, hopefully, he joins us online. Sir, can you hear us? I do. Oh, Perfect. yes. And right. we can hear you as well. So everything works lovely. That's, that's wonderful. And the moderator for this lovely panel is Ivar Bergmanis. Ivar, please. Uh, he is investment banker specializing in Baltic capital markets. And uh, he brings <laughs> along with him something uh, that's not exactly typical. Um, is that something you usually bring to work or, <laughs> or, 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 or it's a gift to us because it's a highlight of your month? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's look at it this way. Investment bankers who work on developing capital markets are like gardeners. Now, this is an orchid and I'll explain some interesting facts about it oh, right. at the beginning. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Ivers. Um, is it okay? You have approximately an hour at your disposal. I don't know whether it's a lot or, or too little for you, but we'll see how it goes and good luck to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Orchids are beautiful and so is the Latvian capital market, of course. Now, with this in mind, I need to state that orchids are an exotic plant requiring a warm climate. So despite the effects of global warming, Latvia is far from being an exotic and warm climate. You will not have any success dealing with a wild orchid in Latvia. The closest anyone has ever come to this is actually Hollywood actor Mickey Rourke, or Mickey's Rorks if you're, uh, if you're Latvian. Now he starred in the 1989 film Wild Orchid, uh, and then did some filming in Riga, Latvia uh, for the film War Hunt just when the COVID-19 pandemic struck. Now, moreover, Latvia is part of the EU and located in the northern reaches of the EU's geography, aka New Nordic or Emerging Nordic. Frontier markets are generally known as exotic investment destinations and a significant number of them are far more suitable for growing orchids. Question, what can be exotic about a country which will soon have been part of the EU bloc for nearly 20 years and for nearly 10 years as part of the Eurozone? So let's roll. Topic one today that we'll be discussing is the CMU and investing in the EU. Abstract, the four freedoms of the EU, free movement of goods, services, capital, and persons. Yet, EU members from Slovakia to Latvia have more in common with the Sahara and Asia than the Eurozone. The Baltic markets are a case in point. 
We've been relegated despite EU, Eurozone, Eurozone, NATO and OECD membership to the frontier, at best, market classification by major index providers. And it's mo mostly about small companies, SMEs, which are a very important part of our economies here. And as a result, capital flows and visibility from within the EU are artificially held back from such markets. So if the aim of the CMU is to have smooth cross-border capital flows together with consistent legislation, then surely there is a need to at least provide an EU-wide consistency also for investors. So we'll be addressing that today. We've already heard today about the relatively small number uh, when it comes to the Latvian capital market and uh, market, uh, capital market development. No need to go into that other than to say that from where it is today, comfortably, there's room to grow five to ten times, and only then would we be reaching average or median levels. So what can be done about this? And what about elsewhere as well in the European Union? The second topic, we'll be talking more about offering documents, applicability, and other commercial realities. And here we're talking about, uh, well, again, smaller markets, documentation requirements in the EU perspective, and would there not then be some opportunities in streamlining and helping cross-border investment to take place, not only for investors elsewhere within the EU, but for these smaller companies, SMEs, nano caps, doesn't matter how you want to describe them, to be able to tap their capital within the EU more efficiently. Thank you very much for uh, the panelists uh, for joining us today. Let's get moving with the first topic. And the first question then is for, for Yella. So Mrs. Watanabe is a fictional Japanese household retail investor in the foreign exchange market. Now, is there a Frau Fräulein Herr equivalent in the EU German retail investor world? And if so, what are their typical habits, please? Thank you, Eva. Before I answer your question, let me say thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for being here. Riga is a beautiful city that I've never been to. <laughs> and congratulations to this impressive conference. Now, I'm in my daily work. I'm managing director of DSW, which is the leading German shareholder association with more than 30,000 members, retail investors but I'm also currently president of Better Finance, which is the European organization representing more than 4 million retail investors. Is it okay? Okay, <laughs> take this microphone, <laughs> right. So, before I answer your question, let me start with an introductory statement because it's something that is really important from my point of view. When we talk about attractive capital markets, when we talk about the capital market union, I think it's a little bit like talking about a cooking recipe. You need the right ingredients and you need the right composition of ingredients to make it really a good dinner. So what is needed for successful capital markets? I think it's from my point of view, you need, first of all, a well-functioning capital market. I think that's something you already have. You need, of course, a reasonable degree of investor protection, something which is very important, fortunately, also for asthma. But what you also need, and it's something that we sometimes forget, you need an attractive tax regime for investors, but also for the SMEs. And very often that's a national issue, because tax is national. So this is a very important ingredient. And when we as Germans take a look at the northern markets, and we will talk about it later, we always, we are envious to be true because they are very successful. They have a high proportion of shareholders. But if you look behind the scene, it's very often also the tax regime and the tax incentives that are so attractive. Of course, you also need attractive companies, which is, extremely important. So if I take a look at Germany, I just want to give you an example, BioNTech. I think a lot of you know this company because they produced 
some of the vaccines in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. This is a successful company, I would say. It's an SME, no, now already, already medium size, I would say. But um, the question is, we have this wonderful company, we have everything around it, and um, we asked the company, why didn't you choose the IPO in Germany? Why didn't you go public in Frankfurt, or in, in Europe at least? They went to NASDAQ. Well, I think we spoke to them, uh, we go to the general meeting, and uh, the answer was very clear. It's not about the prospectus, it's not about uh, multiple voting rights, uh, with, you know, it's not about that. I think it's about the ecosystem. And they gave a very simple as answer. They said, there's just much more capital in the US market. And the IPO will be successful without any problems because we have a much higher market valuation in the US. So, I mean, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to answer your question. I'll come back to that. But I think it's something we should think about. That um, we have to take a look. Why is the U.S. market and the U.K. market, not to forget, uh, that successful? Why are we still waiting for the European Capital Market Union? I mean, I think it's seven years now <laughs> that we're talking in Brussels and in Germany about the capital market union. We all know that we need it for the trans transformation that we are all facing. But still, I think uh, the situation we face is a little bit sobering. So that was my introductory statement. But let me come back to your question, Eva. I just wanted to wake you up a little bit in the morning. The question was, Mrs. Watanabe, I really had to look it up <laughs> because I didn't know about that. <laughs> but let me come back to your question. I think what you want to know is what about the investment behavior of women or let's say investors in general in Germany? And as far as I understand, Mrs. Watanabe stands for the phenomenon of Japanese housewives who invested in currency trading in the early 2000s. They bought yen at low, low rates, changed it mostly in Australian dollars to increase their family savings. So in my view, I would say this was high speculation, this was high risk, but with potentially high returns. But Eva, coming back to you, I have to disappoint you we do not see such a phenomena in Germany. <laughs> On the contrary, I would say German investors in general, including women, are conservative, very conservative. Um, I think um, real estate is very popular. And until the end of last century, life insurance investment was popular. Actually, we all always had a very low rate of shareholder participation of shareholders at all, 5% of the German population in the past. Fortunately, things have changed, and this is due to COVID and also to technical developments. We now have the generation smartphone, like my son, <laughs> and that's a very good thing because um, we have the nail brokers who offer, which offer uh, low cost services also for the trading. And suddenly we see in Germany that the figures of shareholders improved. And now we have, uh, if I take a look at the figures, now we have uh, 2.1 million new investors, age 14 to 29. We have another 2 million new investors, group 30 to 39. Uh, of course, 87% of all of them are male. We should also <laughs> take a look at that. And we also had a close look, do they invest directly or indirectly? Well, 93% of them invest in ETF funds. So it's not the story of Mrs. Vata Nabe, but it's more the story of Thomas 
and his friends. <laughs> That's how we call it and in Germany. Now we have 18.3% of the German populations as direct or indirect shareholders. And we are actually pretty proud on that new figure. And we hope that this development will continue. Lovely. So how much of a challenge then is overall EU market access uh, as well as say custody for, for German retail investors? Well, let me start with this nasty topic custody <laughs> because um, the availability of custody is still a problem. And I would like to give you a very recent example. Better Finance, our European organization, together with DSW, we just published a new study two weeks ago on uh, cross-border voting in Europe. Actually, it's all based on the Shareholder Rights Directive 1 and 2. And uh, we just wanted to find out how does it work in reality. So our member organizations, they bought shares in other European countries and they tried to exercise the most important right of the shareholder, the right to vote. Now, voting cross-border is quite challenging, <laughs> I can tell you. So the outcome of this study was, I would say it was devastating because only in the minority of all the cases, our investors were successful in receiving the voting card and successful in voting at the general meeting. Now, why is this the case? Because there's a whole chain of custodians in between, between the issuer and the investor. And this chain is old fashioned, it's complicated, and it's very costly. So, when we talk about European Capital Market Union, I think this is a very good example where we have to do something. I mean, we have the rules, we have the shareholder rights directive, but it doesn't work in reality and in everyday life. So when we talk about cross-border, we also have to make sure that all the obstacles are abolished in cross-border, such as in the voting procedure. Perfect. Thank you so much. While we're talking here about separate companies, let's maybe even take a step back to the top level and uh, perhaps you know, a quick couple of questions for our most distant guest, Peter. Uh, the Baltic region has experienced capital flow challenges. And I've spoken earlier today of the four freedoms of the EU in terms of visibility. One thing is size. However, you know, despite these other institutional memberships uh, of the EU, Eurozone, NATO and OECD membership, at best, they represent frontier markets. Now, FESA, which is the Federation of European Securities Exchanges, according to its website, represents 30 countries, 35 exchanges, and over 9,000 listed companies. Now, that's a powerful amount of capital market representation, even in an international sense. Now, if we zero in on the European Union, how well is the EU region aligned in terms of a unified investment destination for both international and EU investors, taking into account this Baltic situation, which I just referred to, please. Ivar, thank you very much. Um, and hello to, to Riga. It's uh, really a pity that I couldn't come this time because it's one of the blind spot or white spot on the map of Europe where I have never been. So I promise next time I'm gonna be there. So bad. Uh, that's, uh, uh, yes, not only that, the numbers you said, you know, we also represent 1,676 companies which we listed on our CME markets. So we are the one who is delivering on capital market union. I don't want to be too rude to say we are almost the only one as the exchanges who are delivering, because I don't think that could be said about the global investment banks who frankly don't care about capital market union and SME financing in Europe. They do care about their profit, fair enough, but that's how they are doing business. They are doing business on a couple of blue chips in Europe, advocating things like consolidated tape and as much liberal as possible, as much moving to London as possible, as much moving to US as possible. 
we are here. We are here for Europe and we are here for financing of European companies and especially SMEs. And maybe before I answer, I would, I have to mention this. I listened to the prime minister's speech. I listened to the minister of finance speech. That's really came from another planet. You know, as I was speaking with, uh, on the several panels in uh, elsewhere in Eastern Europe, I have never heard a prime minister together with finance minister so much pressing for development of the capital markets. I, I really envy you, you know, because that's uh, that situation which is very rare and I hope the Latvian capital markets and the whole Baltic region will cherish from it. Um, also, uh, I like the Verna comments on the too much debt financing and need to move more to the equity financing, development of, of retail investment mechanisms. So I, I hope we're gonna have a time to discuss that uh, later on in the panel. But to answer your question, and I like it actually with the ORCID, you are completely right. Uh, you can look at the Europe through the eyes of the several maps. You have a map of NATO, we are one country. You have a map of European Union, we are one country. You have a map of OECD, we are one country. You have a map of index providers and market classification. There is an iron curtain as it was raised in 1947. Still, 2023, we are second class markets. If capital market and any cross-border business should be successful, the European Union have to do something about that. That's, I would say, I would even use the word, it's ridiculous. After so many years of us being members, implementing the same rules, we are just the supermarket for the global investment banks to take our biggest issues to the real markets, as they say, to the big markets, as they say, and we are here playing playing role of second in terms of emerging market or third class citizens or even fourth class citizens because some of the markets in capital market union are not even classified because they are so small. I think this is the case of Slovakia, our neighbor. So this is a huge problem. And I don't buy the argument that there could be development of the companies from those markets by getting listing the excess capital markets into summer market, which is 2000 miles further on on the West, because those markets care only about the big transaction. We need small and medium transaction to grow into the big companies and to grow in a local ecosystem, this need to be strong. That's, I would say, one of the major problems of capital market union. Thank you. So might just Peter, the, the CMU process be partially embraced to rectify this. Now, for example, maybe it's easy to reference an EU universe of shares via a Wilshire 5000 style of index, which actually represents all listed US securities. Now, the idea, of course, is not to compete with traditional index providers, but make the whole EU region a single market for investment contemplation by its own and perhaps also other investors, large or small. I mean, small investors might only see highly selective regional indices when they're uh, reading their news or other news commentary. How would that sound maybe as an approach? Uh, well, definitely possible. But the problem is that most of the money around the world is managed based on the basis of the current index providers. To bring something new, uh, I think many companies try it. We at the Wiener Börse, we were trying also bring the indexes which will which which mixed actually the, the Central European stocks with the Western European stock. Very difficult to convince the investors. Let's let's face the reality. There are trillions of euro and dollars managed around the world and most of them simply rely on one of these three or four index providers the problem is that some of them in their rule book if you read it this rule book is written in the 70s in a in time of the national states for example one of the index providers have their functioning derivative market how many 
markets in EU27 have now functioning derivative markets as, as a condition to be classified as a developed or emerging market. Those are nonsenses which are not valid for European Union. European Union on one hand is saying, I want to somehow, so for example, through EMIR, I want to concentrate the risk, the risk into few centers, which is very good thinking, but it's in contrary to the description of the markets by index providers. Unfortunately, they, index providers, usually don't speak to us. They don't speak to local players. They do speak only to their clients and biggest customers, which is the biggest asset managers in the world. And that's where I'm saying we are serving them, nobody else. However, I believe that if European Commission or ESMA or, I don't know, well, they don't even speak to us as a FESA, will try to make the pressure on those index providers to look at Europe as a one country, as a one investment region, that could make, that could start to make a difference. Um, EBRD is making some efforts in that respect. The efforts are half successful, I would say. They have been successful, I, I believe, in Western Africa, to where they unified a couple of capital markets and convinced the index providers to unify them in one investment zone. And the classification then increased. But uh, I would say we need pan-European move in this matter. Thank you so much. So if we come back to a, to a home-based question, and, and in terms of uh, maybe you know, think global, act local, uh, very much. The Latvian market has, uh, something in the recent years, made very important strides in developing an awareness of capital markets for both issuers and investors. Now, this encouraging improvement has been achieved by the Bank of Latvia's recently merged FCMC regulator operation. Can you perhaps summarize the key things that were addressed? Is it just issuers or is it also a case of addressing other actors in the economy? And if so, who please? Yeah, thank you, Ivars. Uh, uh, definitely um, already years back, we started uh, firstly was assessing actually where we stand. And, uh, and together uh, with the outcome of this ass assessment, we came up with this 10-step uh, program. So, uh, and actually now, year by year, we are following the, the development and success of this 10-step program. So definitely this is based, as already been told, on, on three building blocks major. So government, um, issuers, and the investors. Uh, when it comes to government, uh, I, I'm really glad to hear the Prime Minister, the Ministry of, uh, Minister of Finance, uh, raising the awareness also of, of necessity of also a government participation to build the, the local capital market. And we really need this, um, this, uh, the, the, the basic blocks uh, to open up the, the, the capital market with liquidity, with bigger uh, players like, like state-owned companies. There are a lot of discussions around that, but not only discussions. I believe there already are some actions in the background to, to succeed in, in this area. Uh, also, when it comes to government or like uh, state, and we as the Bank of Latvia also uh, believe are, are the ones of, of policy makers in, in, in this case, or, or uh, sort of supporting the policy ma makers, uh, we also have done a lot uh, to improve uh, the, the local regulation. There have been a lot of amendments in different laws actually to support uh, both investors and the issuers. Uh, recent developments, actually, uh, last year we came up with the, with the, the, the sandbox, security sandbox, and uh, we see already now uh, quite a good interest also from, from uh, municipality companies coming in and trying to understand what they should do to, to go public. Uh, also, the, uh, when it comes to investors, uh, the information avail availability and, and, and also through the sound, uh, sandbox, uh, they, they can also understand actually what to do. 
uh, also uh, the the financial literacy I, I also want to want to touch a bit upon that because uh, very you know well informed and and uh, knowledgeable uh, investor uh, will be the one actually also participating and, and giving the input into the capital markets. So we've done a lot uh, by informing uh, in different channels. Uh, we, we, uh, we have made a lot of different uh, conferences, seminars, smaller groups, bigger groups. Uh, our colleagues actually uh, done the tremendous job by creating the, the uh, uh, radio series uh, called Pelnit Prasme, uh, addressing all those issues actually in both for investors, for issuers, what to do and actually how we all together ca can develop the capital market. Also in terms of um, investor protection, uh, I should mention that uh, we've been very closely uh, working together with the law enforcement agencies. Uh, also, we made a lot of um, uh, learning um, programs for them to for them to, to actually um, excel in, uh, in their ability to understand where the crime actually happens and, uh, and how to tackle those situations. So, um, yeah, I, I believe that all those different already discussions started and, and the different private and public uh, um, parties involved in the, those discussions and, and creating those um, action plans uh, both for, for ministries, um, for, 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 uh, for us as, as the regulator. And uh, I, I think that, that this common work together will bring us uh, to some you know, next steps and, and maybe some successful next steps. Perfect. Thank you so much. So reflecting back to our, to our keynote speaker, maybe a question for Verena. So we've heard today, and not just maybe the Baltic states, smaller markets, uh, considering that they might not be attracting enough capital as opposed to other EU member states. What measures could perhaps be implemented at the EU level to increase their attractiveness or accessibility, please? Thank you, Ivas, and uh, wonderful to sit around this table as well to discuss these important topics. And I think uh, you, it is clear that the importance of ensuring good understanding of what the companies in Latvia, in the Baltics, actually can stand for, what they can bring to the wider economy in Europe and globally, is one of the key aspects. And I think there, some of the developments at the European scale for looking at more transparency around company information, about putting on the same um, platform the companies that are the blue chips, which everyone knows, with some of the companies that are not well known, um, will really help. And being able to compare information, whether it's financial information, whether it's sustainability related information, to allow the investor to actually see companies on across the whole of Europe in the same framework, I think will be extremely important. And that is this European single access point, which I briefly mentioned earlier. But for me, that is one of the things that could really make a difference in investors' perception minds. And that's not only European investors and small retail investors, but maybe also some of the investors from outside of Europe, whose capital we also need to bring into the European market. So I think from that perspective, I think that is very important. A very closely listened to what Peter said about the index providers, I can see that is a real challenge and something that, you know, belongs to the overall ecosystem of ensuring that um, companies are properly being part of the investment universe, which is considered by investors around the board. And then finally, I think I would very much echo what uh, Santa said and, and Yella said as well, the importance of making investors aware and educating them. And I think digitalization has huge opportunities to offer there, but we also need to make sure that investors are properly informed without being overburdened by too much information. That is education, that is the right information that they need to get, and also 
being accompanied in their investment journey to be able to take the right decisions for themselves. So I think all of that is the package that is important to try to drive us forward. And I would very much emphasize that also only with the developments at a regional and national level, we can ultimately build a successful European single market. Of course, we need to try to integrate, to consolidate, to make sure we really have free capital flow across the European Union. But the, particularly for smaller companies, the regional and abilities to actually raise capital will remain important. Thank you so much. We'll be addressing that in the second topic. And just as we're closing uh, the first topic at the moment, Peter, anything maybe you've seen us miss or maybe worth still pointing out on, on the first topic, please? No, I would say, you know, very important is this ESAP, you know, the European Single Access Point. I, uh, I, I was there actually when this idea was born. There was a high level forum and David Wright brought it in basically in uh, where I was a member of the high level forum. Uh, you know, we look at the U.S. Edgar and it's like, why not to do something like that in Europe? You know, everything in English, machine readable. I would say it's, it's a great thing. And I was immediately reacting, you know, in some of the couloir discussion to David. It's like, fine, you know, this is this is very good. Let's share the, all the information. It will help the investors. But uh, let's do it more extensively. Let's do it, for example, also to input the research into that, you know, that the companies could import the, the research that was written on them. I understand that some of the research is expensive because, you know, it, it doesn't have to be completely fresh research, you know, for retail, sometimes it's enough to have a one month old paper, which have definitely lower value than, than the completely fresh paper. And, uh, and also what I'm, I think will be still missing, and uh, I, I believe it can go in a second phase, would be pre-IPO and IPO information. And that's, now I'm touching the problem with the offering in Europe. It's not that difficult actually for a Czech citizen or Latvian citizen or French citizen to buy a Swedish stock, to, to buy a Spanish stock. There are many of providers of the cross-border trading. Comes a little bit more difficult on the SME level, but as the medium and blue chips, it's, it's not that difficult. And frankly, it's not that difficult to find any information on the on the internet if you speak English about those companies, to find uh, what was the trading, to find the last ticks. You even don't need consolidated tape for it because for retail client, you know, it's it's fine. You know, if you have one minute delay data, nobody cares really. If you are not trading as a day trader, uh, what you cannot do is to find any information and get access to the IPOs to the key what we see in the capital market union, raising of the capital for SMEs. Me, as a Czech citizen, there is no way to participate on a Spanish SME IPO. I don't have information. Legally, I even cannot have the information because prospectus is not available and offering is not available outside of the country. It need to be notified and some of the investment banks were to come and notify it in the respective country, find an agent who will distribute it. So there is, this is the limitation for European markets that I, I cannot look up, you know, I would like to invest in a nanotechnology and I would look up into some server anywhere, you know, where I would find out, oh, there are three nanotechnology offerings in Europe in the first quarter. Let's have a look at them. And then I would find some information and send the order to these offerings. I have no chance. Now, look at how it is in the US. If I'm sitting in Ohio, I definitely can look up how many nanotechnologies are offered in the United States. One of them is from California, another one from Seattle, Washington, another one from wherever, Atlanta, Georgia, and I can buy them all. I can send the order to all of them. I can provide them even if I'm sitting in Ohio financing to all of them. And that's a huge difference. The primary markets are not interconnected almost at all. Perfect. Thanks so much. That also reflects on the other's commentary about uh, the actual uh, 
challenges when it comes to, to, to voting. Maybe if we already move into this uh, second topic now, we'll talk a bit further about uh, the, you know, the German and the smaller retail uh, investor in the EU. But if we look at at least from a, from a Latvian uh, perspective, the, the Baltic market is very much one market in the eyes of investors, NASDAQ market uh, infrastructure. Approximately, we can argue here about details, but let's say round number, six million people. Uh, just one of these markets on their own is very small, especially if the market uh, hasn't really developed in terms of the retail investor activity. Has anything notable been done so far in terms of maybe better synchronizing the region's inhabitants with the region's typically SME enterprises needs uh, for capital, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was one of uh, our our goals, uh, actually, to synchronize the Baltic market, uh, understanding that the CMU uh, will be like maybe next step. <laughs> and, uh, and we've done a lot, actually. And now uh, all the prospectus, the all uh, information uh, submitted to the local regulators actually is fully aligned. And uh, now we also already have a couple of examples when uh, actually the, the uh, issuer goes uh, simultaneously both uh, Latvian and, and, and Estonian or Latvian and Lithuanian uh, NASDAQ for IPO and actually does it quite sex successfully. Uh, actually, our experts have worked uh, in different, um, you know, working groups to align both, like, as I said, the, 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 the uh, prospectus documentation, all other information uh, provided to, to, the, to the market. Uh, but also, uh, we are still looking forward to, uh, to improve each and every regulatory aspect in, 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 the, in Baltic. So we, we aligned what kind of laws should we change in all three countries, what kind of internal regulation should be changed. And uh, we are sort of already two thirds of that being done. And actually maybe some, some uh, leftovers are there, but we believe that end of this year, we will finally be, be fully aligned within the Baltic states. And this makes actually, uh, us also a bit more uh, already, I, I think this is like next uh, step towards the, the, the indexes to be uh, uh, interested, interesting for, for, for bigger, uh, also passive investors. Uh, so hope that this will evolve, definitely. Because one of the key things I think here and having experienced it myself is mm -hmm. we're not talking about uh, huge transactions here where you know there's 50 million, 100 million, hundreds of millions of euros being raised. But if we're talking about anywhere from 1 million to 8 million, which is a typical benchmark within the EU prospectus regulation, going cross-border is, well, to put it politely, a bit of a headache. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's great to hear. So I understand that there are things uh, afoot uh, to also address that smaller end. Uh, of the actual uh, offering uh, area. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, maybe then, Yella, on the, on the back of that, uh, so can you mention any typical level of engagement perhaps? Uh, what is there in terms of new or follow-on uh, offerings versus standard secondary trading from, from German retail investors? I mean, Peter earlier mentioned that the challenges of him investing maybe in other uh, let's say uh, markets within the in the EU, but at least within Germany. Uh, I mean, is there a greater proportion of this sort of uh, long-term buy hold uh, versus, let's say, speculative short-term trading? And and how thoroughly is the information in offering documentation typically scrutinised? I mean, are there meaningful differences between issuers on the same market, let's say, regulated versus growth or MTF? Any, any particular insights you might be able to share on a, on a German perspective there, please? Sure. Um, yeah, let me start uh, with the point of Peter. He said it's, it's difficult to participate in an IPO in another country. Well, I can tell you it's already difficult to participate in an IPO in Germany as a German. <laughs> so let me take the example of Porsche last year. I mean, we because the capital markets did not run very well last year. We had three IPOs all over the year, which is almost nothing. One of it was Porsche. 
And everyone in Germany, because of the brand, and that's a very important uh, issue, because of the name Porsche, everyone knows it, uh, everyone wanted to sign in for a Porsche share. But to tell you the truth, it was oversigned, so of course not everyone could receive it. So nothing to do with, uh, with cross-border issues. It depended actually on the, on the bank you uh, were client. If you were one at one of the issuer's bank, then it was easier, <laughs> as it typically is. Uh, but this is just uh, to mention, and I think that's one of the important points. Um, ESAP is a very important step, number one. I believe it's from the investor's point of view, this uh, European single access point will help a lot. But that's the one side, that's information. The other point, and that's why I took the Porsche example, is you have to raise the awareness uh, of, of the investors to go and buy a Porsche, for example. And you, you ask me, well, how is the German retail investor when we look at our uh, members, yeah, the majority is definitely long-term oriented. We always say they are very loyal and they stay until the very end. The very end, <laughs> which in the case of Wirecard was really the end. Uh, so uh, that's the typical retail investors. Of course, they are also short-term oriented uh, other investors, but that's not uh, the majority, uh, to be honest. And we recommend to them that they should go into regulated markets because we think there is more transparency, there is more uh, about investor protection. And also we have the experience of the Neue market from the uh, 1990s. At that time, everybody was enthusiastic about uh, going public and um, they all lost a little bit the orientation. Nobody looked at profits anymore. Nobody looked at the business models. Nobody looked at the key performance figures. So, of course, afterwards, uh, when the bubble uh, ended, everybody was disappointed. And that's something where we have to look at and say, yeah, lessons we have to learn for the future. And also, maybe one last point, retail investor is important because they are the loyal ones and they are stabilizing the uh, uh, investor community. But retail investors cannot do without institutional investors. So we need them both because the institutional investors, they give the liquidity we need. So we always have to look at the right balance when we look at the investors. Thank you. Speaking of investors, uh, one thing is to, to raise new money or have a, a follow-on offering. Another thing, of course, is, and this is where one assumption is that you've got institutional investors there for large transactions, but that's not always the case, especially for markets uh, such as here. And one of the interesting uh, cases I was also involved with uh, in the previous year is if you don't have access to a deep pool of institutional investors from around the world, again, because of this indexation aspect, or even maybe local pension funds, they're a little bit pickier, which I respect, uh, in terms of their abilities to invest. But that means uh, for a region like the Baltics or Latvia, you've got significant shareholdings uh, being held by strategic founders, similar investors, which also then implies low free float. However, if one or several of these investors wants to actually exit, not fully, but even partially. So here we're talking about, let's say they want to go over a little bit over a million euros. The risk, I believe at the moment, is that you're immediately going to fall into the domain of, okay, please prepare a prospectus, uh, especially if it's the regulated market. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's take it from there. And we actually had this case uh, in, in Latvia uh, for, for a regulated market company, Delphin Group. Could this maybe, uh, and, and a question maybe initially for, for, for Santa, having been indirectly involved, you know, obviously with this as being the ro local regulator, could something like this perhaps also be further standardized 
uh, within the EU as well, because ultimately, if we want more liquidity, if we are then relying on the smaller investor mm -hmm. to take part, not an institutional, the documentational requirements, they need to be balanced. Investor protection is crucial as well. But if all material information uh, has already been published, might there be a way of somehow tweaking this into a more efficient process maybe uh, down the road, having, having freshly experienced it? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We are, we are um, quite, quite you know, optimistic on, on the way to actually standardize the, the processes. And uh, yeah, with this uh, former experience, I think that's, uh, we, we saw the issue and, uh, and uh, we are trying to, to deal with that. And hopefully we will get there. But I, I think this is also a bit more global than yeah. local. And, and, and speaking of global yeah. versus local, Peter, have you had many situations like that uh, at all uh, that you've uh, come across, maybe across maybe some of these other markets within the EU along those lines? Yeah, well, all these discussions about uh, the, the situation where um, I would say potential issuer is very strongly advised and lobbied, you know, to, to list elsewhere, you know, to basically forget about the local capital markets. We see it on a daily basis. Uh, the, the problem is that, and I, I fully understand the investment banks, they have their budgets, but uh, they, they don't want to do transactions which are, for example, made duly in uh, on the local market where, where the stock belongs and also some other markets. So basically all of the securities or all of the IPOs, potential IPOs I see in the region and are bigger than 200 million euro, which is quite a sizable, which would be really helpful for local ecosystems, are immediately, immediately uh, attended by the, by the global investment banks and the advice is usually list somewhere else. Don't list local. And if we are approaching the companies, they're saying, oh, we get advised by this very renowned investment bank, you know, that it's better, you know, they have very colorful presentation and everything. Most of them end up in disaster because they find out that uh, to be uh, 523rd biggest company in some of the bigger markets, they don't get into the, any index at all. Is It's not that great that it's maybe going to be better to be seventh biggest in Prague or third biggest in Latvia but they usually find it only after the deal and you cannot do anything about that. And I would say specifically, there are two or three investment houses who are advising European companies to turn into the PLC and list in London, which I, which I find completely ridiculous. Uh, here maybe if, if your finance minister or prime minister is still in the room, uh, there is a great example from Romania, which I now see that there is going to be, I hope, there's going to be a huge um, IPO for Hydroelectrica, which is a sizable deal of a multi-billion euro transaction. And basically the request from the Romanian government, who is the majority shareholder, was, no, we need it. We understand that you would like to have it in New York, London or elsewhere. No, it's going to be in Bucharest because we we think there's not going to be less demand. I fully, fully support that. There's not going to be less demand because still it's going to be a Romanian company. And we also need to support local capital markets and local ecosystem. So the result is the listing going to be only in Bucharest. And I think that's a, that's a wise decision from the government perspective. Perfect. Thank you so much. Now, I'm told there's many questions, so maybe a, a final word from uh, Verena, uh, maybe, and, and the question would be this before we go into questions from the uh, participants. Uh, how can we ensure an even attractiveness for capital across the EU? Any, any good suggestions? There? <laughs> it's uh, the million dollar question that uh, is uh, definitely not easy to solve. But for me, I think there are a number of different ways to try to get a more even attractiveness. I think one of them is clearly to make sure that we have a common 
regulatory framework to which we work. And Santa was talking about how you're trying to, already at the Baltics, bring that closer together. Clearly, at a European level, we are trying to drive more common regulatory frameworks and also looking at what we, can we do to make those frameworks more attractive. And I think I was mentioning earlier the listing review, you know, making some of these public offerings uh, easier, more efficient, I think are all areas which are important to look at. Not easy because you need to always also cater for the local regional markets and their specificities, but I think that is one. So that's on the more regulatory side. The other uh, part of that, to my mind, is also greater consistency of how supervision actually happens on the ground. And if you talk about prospectuses, it's about prospectus approval, you know. Um, do the national competent authorities actually look at that in a similar way? Do they have the same efficiency and speed in, in doing it? How much do they um, focus on one particular area rather than another? Of course, again, this is something which is partly cultural based, partly based on the markets, but certainly what we found also when we did a so-called peer review of prospectus approval is there's still a huge variety of different practices. And I think that ultimately makes the business environment more complex and by actually driving more convergence also in supervisory approaches and processes, we can actually simplify processes and reduce compliance costs for people wanting to do cross-border business. And that is clearly what we should be doing to try to foster the, the European markets. Yes, thank you. And, and one of the questions he addressed specifically to you, <laughs> uh, it says that one reason that discourages SMEs to list is burdensome requirements for listed companies. So in your view, should requirements be reduced for SMEs? I mean, we've indirectly covered this. Uh, any initial thoughts there, or might it be then maybe something which is more regionalized? What, what, what maybe comes to your mind after hearing that sort of a question? No, I think that's been exactly the considerations that have been driving a lot of the considerations in the European framework and reforming it. Obviously, there's a big question, what is one country's SME is actually a blue chip in another country. So first of all, finding common European ways of even looking at this question is extremely difficult. Um, at the same time, I think the main purpose obviously is to try to, on the one hand, reduce burdens and make sure that SMEs are able to fulfill the requirements in an effective and efficient way. But as a regulator, we always also need to think about, at the same time, making sure that there's sufficient information in what is being provided so that the investors has the basic information to make informed decisions. Because ultimately, no one is being served if we then just create a market which is basically the Wild West that will not build trust and that will not ultimately uh, attract capital over time. So you need to get the balance right. And for me, it also means a certain minimum level that you need to be able to rely on to get wherever you are looking at a company in Europe. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And maybe it's worth doing a very quick... Uh, yes, Peter? Sorry, maybe if I can add to that, it's a very important point. You know, if, uh, if you look at the IPO, which is smaller, the IPO is basically the same as the big IPO. And the problem is with the fees. You know, if you have a 30 million IPO and a 1 billion IPO, the work around that is usually almost the same, both for the company and both for advisors, investment bank and, and uh, tax advisors and lawyers, you know. So, so it, it is then becoming um, an economic problem, you know, how to do the smaller IPOs. One cannot imagine that you know you can do the same way the one billion and thirty million. You have to find innovative ways. And what would be really helpful uh, from, uh, of course, European regulators to make the the life of the local and small, both investment banks who are bringing these IPOs, maybe also the exchanges, but we can handle that, and uh, and the companies easier to make some reliefs from very expensive things like the extensive prospectus directive. I understand investors have to be informed. I fully agree with Verena. There have to be some, uh, some minimal requirements, but, but we have to have a look, you know, how we can make prospectus easier, how we can uh, make MAR easier, 
um, research unbundling, you know, return it back. You know, we could, we have to bundle the research with the SME markets or with the with the execution. Uh, I think that would help availability of the research on the market. We have to make some reliefs from tough ESG requirements, and I can continue on and on. And we have to make some release also for those investment banks who are doing this small investment banks, you know, local investment banks, small investment banks who are doing these small IPOs and developing the ecosystems. We have to make their life easier to make the transactions cheaper. I think the politically correct term for small investment banks is boutiques. Uh, so maybe, maybe we use that term. But uh, maybe a, a very quick temperature check. And by the way, uh, corporate sponsored research, again, is something which is being addressed uh, through time that might uh, assist here. But maybe a quick temperature check within the panel. Uh, we've mentioned SMEs. We've mentioned small capital raisings. What for each panel participant here is an SME and or small cap in terms of millions of euros of market capitalization, let's maybe just see what sort of a range we fall into, just to see where the where the where the scope is. Who would like to go first? Well, if you want, I will start. <laughs> um, I would actually take the definition of the EU Commission SME. So turnover, I think, until 10 million euro is uh, small, and if you have a turnover up to 50 million, that would be medium size. So that, I, I would think that it's the same definition in Germany. Here the challenge we fall into though, of course, is valuation, uh, because it's not always a metric with the, with the sales angle. Uh, so I mean, feasibly, let's say the comfort factor for a German investor to say, small company, where, where do you think that might sit for, let's say a retail uh, investor? What would be the approximate market cap, do you think? I think, uh, to be honest, it shouldn't be too small because then you have the risk with the liquidity. Uh, you have to take a close look at the shareholder structure. Is there a major shareholder? How much shares do, uh, does this person or institution hold? This is something that uh, is very important for a retail investor mm -hmm. because then uh, you know the, the future of the company depends on the major shareholder and that's something you have to keep in mind as a retail investor. Thank you. Uh, maybe Sandra? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, we know the classification of, of uh, SME definition in Europe, and definitely we've been lowering the bar. So, <laughs> uh, otherwise, actually, it's um, very, very hard uh, to, to, to assess. And, and, and really, you know, s saying that 10 million turnover is still a small, it's not the case here locally. Definitely, 10 million goes already to some medium sized company. So, that's how we look at that. Maybe any um, I'm thoughts? very boring. I'm following <laughs> Yella on the uh, European uh, mm -hmm. uh, definitions. But I think um, I just wanted to come back to one thing Peter said earlier. I think we shouldn't forget that some of what we're talking about is also not just financial regulation, it's also company law. And you talked about taxes earlier, fiscal. All of that is obviously very national and very local, and I think that's also creating barriers to some of this, what we are talking about here, that goes far beyond the financial regulation. I just wanted to add that. Perfect, thank you. Peter, anything to add there, please? Uh, perfect. And I was just first to react to this, you know, small dialogue with Verena. I fully agree, Verena. I fully agree. You know that. I'm saying how it is possible that we are building Common European Union for 60 years already, and we don't have a single accountant. You know, that's, that's completely ridiculous. I can understand that, you know, to make a withholding tax, you know, regime more, uh, more single and more, more fluent, it's maybe difficult because the taxes are on a national level, uh, securities law, bankruptcy law, all that, you know, we need to work on in order to organize basically a single, a single market in Europe. I fully agree. It's not only about the regulation of the capital markets, but it's on the corporate law level, many of them in accounting, for example. Um, back to your question, what is SME? Uh, obviously, as I'm representing, the, I'm sitting on the boards of various exchanges. I was sitting on the board in Ljubljana, I'm sitting on the board in Prague, Vienna. I'm now representing FESA, so I understand that everybody has a different view. But I would say the most important thing is that we should stop to look at the definition of SME as European Union has it now. 
volume of uh, the revenues or number of employees. I don't know what is there. Capital market, there is one thing which is important and is a market cap. Is the value of the company, Ivars, you said it. And that's a difference between the small, medium and large. And how we look at it, for example, in the Czech Republic, which is slightly different than in Austria, anything which have to be done locally or maybe regionally around with Austria, for example, and Polish funds and whatever, is, is are deals which are offering size usually around 100, 150 million euro maybe 100 you know those are two small deals usually to involve anybody any asset manager which is coming from abroad from let's say western europe or us uk uh anything which is larger than that um can be considered as a standard deal where where also the international usual international investment banks are starting to get involved in and uh, the placement is going also to the to the international market, which is very different than a view of the SME uh, in, uh, for example, in Germany or in UK. You know, they consider SME uh, anything in a couple of billions euro actually value. So you know, it's it's a little bit moved, but mm. I would say the most important thing we should look at the market cap, not in this revenue or whatever other that they are good for subsidies and everything, but for capital market. It is the market cap, which is differentiating companies. Thank you so much. Let me very briefly chip in, right? We're, we're approaching the end of the panel. We have less than 10 minutes left. And there are tons of questions. We've been kind of uh, um, showing them here uh, on, the, on the big screen as well. Um, and by the way, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I feel overwhelmed uh, by, by your response and, and, and your engagement. Um, uh, before I give the opportunity, uh, can you see those questions on, on yes. my computer? Uh, so cool. Just yeah. need to wake it up. Who, whoever wants to take them. But uh, uh, you were doing some temperature checks uh, among your panelists. I want to do a quick uh, temperature check within the audience. So if you could uh, grab your smartphones and, and once again log on to the uh, Slido page. We've got a question for you related to panel. This is something that um, Ivar's already tested a little bit, uh, introduced in his questions and, and, and discussion here. Uh, and, but we wanted to uh, know what you think, being an expert audience. And so our question is, should the CMU process include creating a more investable EU by ensuring its members are jointly represented as a single region via existing or new financial market indices? This was a question on a panel, perhaps gave some food for, uh, for thought to you as well. Let's very briefly check uh, what you think about this idea, whether it would make sense or not. I think we can leave this on the screen just a little bit so that we see the trends in this voting as you do it. But because of uh, time constraints, I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give the floor back to you. There's, there's a, a wide range of questions there. Um, maybe they can be addressed to some of the members of the panel as, as you approach uh, the, the end of the panel there. Thank you very much. OK, well, I think long story short, we have a pretty convincing re response there. Uh, one thing which I'm, I'm missing at the moment, uh, Eddie, is I, I don't have your fingerprint. Uh, so maybe All right. Bit, uh, you don't? No. Is not that, yet. Not ain't yet. that surprising? <laughs> All right. So Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. How much time do we have, by the way? Um, uh, just... We've got something like five minutes, I think. Okay. Okay. Can we... And I think uh, you could use the question list there. You have the, uh, the vote there is okay. it okay i'll go to the q a yep so scrolling through here we did address uh one of these questions uh relating to uh the uh let's say well smes and and requirements uh one other question which uh comes up here is that would compulsory investments of pension funds in certain activities attract more investors to the market uh, is that something uh, i mean we've heard of the polish case but uh, in short are there any any strong feelings or emotions from the other panel members here please uh, on, on on that particular topic who would like to go first um, i think it is very important that you allow 
pension funds uh, to go into uh, stock markets. I know in the past that was always a problem for Germany and also for the life insurance companies because they were not allowed to invest uh, above a certain percentage. Now, this was changed by law and I think it, it's a necessity because you need these big players uh, to invest the money because that's again something about liquidity. Yeah, actually, we also locally has changed the regulation uh, to allow the pension funds to increase the participation also locally. However, uh, the infrastructure should be there. Actually, the liquidity and other, you know, uh, market indicators should be there to to actually encourage those pension funds to invest there. And on the other hand, when investing, you, you can't just force invest locally because uh, this is about also, um, you know, protection of, of the, the potential pensioners <laughs> afterwards if the actual returns will not be sufficient. So uh, we should work on the infrastructure first. A um, very important point to my mind as well, to get pension funds uh, ability to invest. Forcing, I think, is something you need to be a bit more careful about. But I think having pension funds active in the markets is key. But I would say it goes beyond that because it's also for the actual pensioners. If they know that their pension mm. is more driven by capital market outturns, it changes completely the culture of engagement with the capital markets. And I think we've seen that, for example, in the very good example of Sweden, which I think the finance minister quoted earlier. It is far more of a tradition that you actually, because you know you have choices in your pension system that brings you closer to making choices in the capital market, you have a completely different cultural approach to capital markets. And I think their pensions are extremely important as well. Perfect. Peter? Uh, I fully agree with the ladies. Uh, forcing somebody to make it a compulsory, no. Uh, I would say that would be a wrong approach. Although I have to admit, it helped Polish capital markets greatly in their beginnings. You know, they were like on the steroids growing. Uh, what Verena just now said, you know, uh, that there should be some motivation, obviously. The motivation is actually a great thing to invest. And Swedish example is perfect. You know, the, to have some uh, tax advantages if you are investing uh, your pension money on the capital markets and helping the CMEs from your own country is is perfect thing. But, you know, forcing a percentage of the pension funds, probably not. They should be allowed to invest whatever they want, but uh, I would not force them. Perfect. Thank you. Maybe one last question here for Verena. Um, and this is, is there evidence that uh, ESAF introduction has increased liquidity? The what introduction? ESAP. ESAP. Yeah. Um, ESAP doesn't exist yet. Exactly. So, so um, uh, I'm afraid we will have to wait for a few years before we know whether the introduction will have made a difference. Mm -hmm. But I'm hopeful that it will. Perfect. That's something uh, I think uh, will be certainly coming through, uh, you know, going forwards. But we just need time. Uh, and uh, everything that I think we've spoken about today. Uh, shows there's no one single approach which uh, would suddenly give a solution that everything's going to be totally fine. There's things that we need to do on a national level, regional level, international EU level, uh, but certainly many things also combining us uh, in, a, I believe, a united front, uh, speaking from an EU, whether we're talking uh, indices and things like that, but plenty of work to be done in many, many different locations. So I think cooperation amongst all of us is essential. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, distinguished panel, for uh, taking part, sharing your views today. We just finished. Perfect timing. And we'll pass it across back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, a big round of applause to our panelists and to, to the moderator as well. Uh, if, you, if you could stay for a second, uh, still please. So, um, just a couple of things I need to resolve. Um, uh, first thing, thank you very much for your activity uh, on Slido. I mean, 20, uh, 91 um, respondents uh, for this poll, thank you very much. Uh, it's not the most perfect sociology, but it does give a sense of what, uh, what the expert 
crowd here thinks about the issue. Thank you for this and for the questions. Some of those questions might be uh, discussed and addressed during the coffee break as well uh, for, uh, for your kind of in-person interaction over there. Uh, another question that needs to be resolved, what happens to the orchid? <laughs> We'll address that. Maybe we have to right. have a, a vote. I, I yes. suggest it stays here as kind of a good luck charm for, for the forum today. <laughs> we can do that. Will that work? Okay, that's Let's perfect. That. Thank you very much. Uh, another thing, we break for coffee now, and, um, and every one of you are so tired after a couple of years of Zoom conferences, so you want to chat, you want to network, and that is perfect. That is part of the wonder of this conference. But when in 25 minutes I try to invite you back, please do respond, all right, <laughs> so that we can restart in time. Thank you very much. I'll see you in a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.